On April 8, 2024, just a couple of weeks from now, there will be a total solar eclipse crossing the United States. Compared with the last total solar eclipse that crossed the country in 2017, this year's event is expected to last longer and the sky will fall much darker. In addition, millions more people will be able to see one of the biggest astronomy events of their lives. Nearly 32 million people will be inside a path of totality, which is about two and a half times the 2017 eclipse. This will also be the last major eclipse across North America for 20 years. With Christians interested in Bible prophecy, there's been no shortage of YouTube videos claiming that this eclipse marks a judgment from God. They point out the path of the 2017 total eclipse and the 2024 eclipse and notice that a giant X does indeed form over the heart of America. Adding to the effect, these two eclipses are almost but not quite seven years apart and many are convinced that something terrible is about to happen. So, are these types of eclipses a sign that God's judgment is upon us? What does the Bible actually say on this matter? About two years back, I did a lengthy video that looked into what the Bible teaches us about signs in the heavens above, especially things such as solar eclipses and blood moons. Before I play that video, I have to warn everyone up front, some of you will not like what I'm going to say but this is what the Bible teaches us on this subject. Here's the video. In this video, we'll take a look at what the Bible really says about signs in the sun, moon and stars during the end times and talk a bit about blood moons as well. Nowadays, you can find thousands of videos on YouTube that cover this topic and many of them tie in specific events happening and describe how they say it relates to imminent rapture the tribulation, or other end times prophecy. In fact, as I'm making this video in mid-June of 2022, there are quite a number of Christian YouTube channels promoting the idea that the return of Jesus is likely over the next couple of months, largely based on what they perceive as signs in the stars above. Of course, this isn't anything new. For thousands of years, mankind has been looking up at the stars, not only mesmerized by their beauty, but perceiving patterns and signs that they felt might portend the future. And in a way, that's understandable. There's nothing quite like gazing up in wonderment at the stars, trying to understand what incredible artist created such a masterpiece, and by extension, why did this artist also create us? What is our purpose for being here? When I was a kid, I was very much into astronomy, and I was always looking up at the night sky through my binoculars or a small telescope. The vastness of the universe was breathtaking to me, even at a young age. There were often times, especially on a clear, cold night, that the sheer number of stars I was seeing was so overwhelming and so awe-inspiring that I somehow knew I was looking upon the handiwork of God. As I got a bit older and into my late teenage years, I started reading the Bible a bit and gravitated toward verses that deal with end prophecy. It seemed like the more I read the Bible, the more I appreciated the stunning beauty of the heavens above. Soon, I started to hear other Christians talk about how the Bible tells us that there would be signs in the sun, moon and stars during the end times. This certainly interested me, as suddenly, eschatology was going hand in hand with my love of astronomy. So, I began to do a bit of my own research into what Bible verses do talk about signs in the sun, moon and stars and as they say, there's no place to begin like the beginning. As I look to discover what the Bible says will happen in the last days, one of the first verses I pondered was, of course, Genesis 1.14, in which God says this, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. This is where the Bible tells us that there will be signs in the heavens. Genesis 1.14 is probably the verse most Christians reference, but it's also a verse that a lot of us will read superficially without truly thinking about what it means. I found this verse curious as it didn't give any specifics about what the signs are or in what way they would be used. Would a natural alignment of the sun, moon and stars occasionally double as a sign, or will God use them in other ways? It simply didn't say. In fact, it seems so generalized that almost anything in the heavens above could be viewed as a sign of something to someone. 
I couldn't help but wonder why the verse would speak of prophetic signs in the sky in almost a nonchalant matter. Upon more studying, I realized that not only was I looking at Genesis 1.14 in the wrong way, but it actually means something entirely different than what most Christians think it does. It turns out that Genesis 1.14 is not referring to prophetic signs in the sky after all, and is a perfect example of how we shouldn't take part of a verse out of context, because by doing so we may misunderstand its true meaning. It also demonstrates why we should check translations other than the King James from time to time, as they can often bring clarity to a verse and help us to understand it from the proper perspective. Here's what I mean. Look again at Genesis 1-14 and pay particular attention to the verbiage after the word signs, the part that says seasons, days and years. These words describe periods of time and are important because they modify the word signs to mean division of time. In other words, signs doesn't mean prophetic signs, but rather guideposts to help us understand when seasons, days and years begin and end. The verse is stating that the lights that God created would be used as signs of seasons, days and years. Indeed, the rising and setting of the sun is a sign of the beginning or ending of a day, and the moon going through its faces helps us mark each month going by, and the movement of the sun and stars helps us to understand the years. The correct understanding of Genesis 1.14 isn't that the lights in the sky will be random signs of prophecy, but that they are intended to help us correctly divide time into seasons, days, and years. A moment ago, I mentioned how looking at translations other than the King James can come in handy, and that's exactly the case here. Here are other translations of Genesis 1.14 that perfectly clarify the meaning of this verse. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. Nivi. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. NLT. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. ESV. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be signs to indicate seasons and days and years. Net. And God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. NLT. These translations make the meaning of this verse clear. Genesis 1.14 is not telling us that the stars, moon, and sun will be random prophetic signs that are secret, and only a few people can figure out or even see. Instead, the verse is stating that the stars, moon, and sun are tools for us to properly divide time. They are signposts for us to correctly note the days, months, and years as they pass by. Having said that, there are verses other than Genesis 1.14 which clearly talk about some stunning events in the last days, from the stars not giving their light to the moon turning red to the sun being darkened, those are the verses that we need to focus on, as they will give us a better idea of the events to happen in the future. And a couple of those verses reference one particular sign that much of Christianity has latched onto, the moon turning to blood. One of the more popular ideas in recent years is that blood moons are among the signs the Bible talks about, and there's no shortage of books and videos on the subject. In fact, there are entire ministries built around the concept of blood moons and prophecy. But some blood moon comes from the face of the moon turning reddish as it passes behind the earth 
and into its shadow. On average, there are three blood moons every two years. Some years have none, and others have several. The three places in the Bible where the moon is described as turning blood red are Joel 2.31, Acts 2.20, which quotes Joel 2.31, and Revelation 6.12. In Joel 2.31 we read, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. This verse was quoted by Peter in Acts 2.20, and in Revelation 6.12 we see the moon described this way, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. In 2008, a pastor from Tacoma, Washington, by the name of Mark Biltz, announced that he had discovered an astronomical phenomenon that might point to the date of the Lord's return. That discovery, he said, was how blood moons related to Bible prophecy. The resulting blood moon mania swept over much of Christianity in the years afterward, led primarily by author and televangelist John Hagee. The idea of the tetrad, where consecutive lunar eclipses began to pick up steam. Tetrads are rare but not extremely so, as they come in cycles of roughly 600 years, give or take a few years. For about 300 years there are no tetrads at all, followed by a period of roughly 300 years, where a tetrad occurs approximately every 15 years. The latest 300 years cycle, where we see tetrads began in 1901, and as of June 2022, we are almost halfway through the 15-year period where they show up. The previous tetrads took place in 2014 and 2015, and the next one will happen during 2032 and 2033. In fact, Leading up to 2014, many Christian leaders jumped on the Tetrad bandwagon and predicted that significant prophetic events would occur, culminating with the fourth lunar eclipse in September of 2015. Some even predicted the rapture or the end of the world. As we now know, none of those things happened in 2014 or 2015, and it turns out there's a good reason why. There are a lot of problems with the theory that naturally occurring blood moons and tetrads are related to Bible prophecy. If you never look too deeply into the idea of how blood moons, and specifically tetrads, relate to Bible prophecy, you might be surprised to learn that there are a number of problems with this idea. Here are seven of those problems. 1. The Bible does not tell us to watch for tetrads, nor does it ever attach any significance to them prophetically. The blood moons period itself was sparked up by Mark Biltz in 2008 and further publicized by televangelist John Hagee. 2. Despite the put announcements that previous blood moon tetrads coincide with remarkable events affecting the Jewish people, that claim is questionable at best. For example, one of the supposed events was the Alhambra Decree of 1492, which concerned the expulsion of Jews from Spain, and yet that event was a year or two before the Blood Moon Tetrads appeared in 1493 and 1494. Likewise, a tetrad supposedly marked the state of Israel's independence in 1948, and yet the tetrad itself occurred in 1949-1950, up to two years after the events. Two years later is not exactly the definition of prophecy fulfilled. 3. Other tetrads have happened throughout history, but no significant events affecting Jews at those times. For example, the years 162, 796, 842 and 860 AD all had blood moon tetrads, and yet no major singular corresponding events. Some claimed that the Tetrad of 162 AD came at the height of the worst persecution of Jews in the history of the Roman Empire. However, this is very hard to quantify, as Rome consistently persecuted Jews for many years before 162 AD, as well as many years after. 4. Significant events for the Jewish people had no Tetradic activity at all. 
one being the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, leading to the deaths of one million Jews. In fact, there are no tetrads at all from 180 to 180. Another is the Holocaust, which resulted in the deaths of more than six million Jews. There were no blood moon tetrads from 1939 to 1945. Also, the Yom Kippur War of 1973 had no blood moon tetrads. 5. Blood moon tetrads are not visible to everyone. Even though they are touted as signs from God, a blood moon tetrad is only visible to the side of the earth that is in darkness. So half of the world at most could see it, but the other half definitely cannot. This is extremely reminiscent of the so-called Revelation 12 sign in September of 2017, which was not only unseen by nearly everyone on earth, but wasn't even understood as being a sign by most people. Sending secret signs to a small number of people is not what the Bible tells us will happen. 6. Perhaps most importantly, when the Bible describes the moon turning to blood, it is in conjunction with other events also happening, such as the sun and stars going dark, and even a massive earth khaki. The moon turning to blue isn't happening in a vacuum, seven. It's absurd to connect blood moons falling on feast days as signs of biblical prophecy coming true. Israel uses a lunar calendar and bases their feasts upon the phases of the moon. Because of this, it should be obvious that lunar eclipses will fall on Jewish feast days with some regularity and shouldn't be used as a sign of Bible prophecy being fulfilled. So, just by looking into this a bit further, we can see that the idea of attaching tetrads to Bible prophecy is on really shaky ground. It just doesn't hold up under closer examination and should in no way be relied upon to forecast what happens in the last days. Unfortunately, there are those who are holding on to the idea that things like the rapture or the tribulation can be determined by naturally occurring blood moons or how certain planets line up in the constellations above. These things are not biblical at all. So let's now turn to the Bible and see what it really says about signs of the sun, moon and stars because within those verses is not only a consistency that is surely lacking in the blood moons theory, but we'll find specific descriptions of what is going to happen. To reiterate, Genesis 1.14 is not telling us that there will be random prophetic signs in the heavens, but rather that the sun, moon and stars were given to us as tools to help us understand the passage of time, to mark the feasts, and days, months, and years. I also talked about how the blood moon tetrad theory is not based on sound doctrine at all, and in fact, I'd compare it to absurdities like the Bible code theory, which has also fooled many Christians into believing that there are hidden secrets to understanding God's word. However, as most of us know, there are many verses in the Bible that talk about something happening to the sun, moon, and stars in the end times. And what happens is, not only truly shocking, but these things will be seen by everyone on earth. Let's take a look at those verses right now. And I'm not including a few verses that only mention what's happening on the earth, as the focus of this video is on what we will see in the heavens above in the very near future. Here are 12 verses that reference what is going to happen to the sun, moon and stars during the end times. After we go through them, I'll talk about what we can learn from these verses. 1. Isaiah 13.10 For the stars of the sky and its constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. 2. Isaiah 34.4 all the host of heaven shall rot away, and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall, as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. 3. Jeremiah 4.23 I looked on the earth, and behold, it was without form and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. 4. Ezekiel 32.7-8 When I blot you out, 
I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you, and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. 5. Joel 2.10 The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. 6. Joel 2.31 The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. 7. Joel 3.15 The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. 8. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. 9. Mark 13, 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. 10. Luke 21.25 and there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. 11. Acts 2. Tau Tau The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. 12. Revelation 6.12 When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood. When looking at the verses which talk about what will happen in the sky during the last days, we can notice five distinct and consistent descriptions. 1. The sun will be darkened. 2. The stars will be darkened. 3. The moon will turn to blood. 4. The moon will be darkened. 5. These things happen after the tribulation, the context of these verses also seems to imply that these things happen simultaneously, or perhaps within a very short time of each other. That is important because a lunar eclipse cannot happen simultaneously with a solar eclipse, not naturally anyway. Either the moon comes between the earth and the sun, causing a solar eclipse, or the earth comes between the sun and the moon, causing a lunar eclipse. As you may have also noticed, a couple of the verses specifically state that these events happen after the tribulation, not before, which means that they cannot be connected to anything happening before the tribulation, such as a pre-tribulation rapture. These are events that occur just after the tribulation and just before or simultaneous with the return of Jesus. Even more than that, the context of the verses teaches us that the majority of people on the earth will see what's happening in the sky above, as Revelation 6, 15, 17 states, Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich and the powerful, and every one, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Compare that verse to the claims of some on YouTube that certain alignments of stars or planets, or a specific blood moon, mark these prophetic events, even though very few people can actually see what's going on with them. If we consider the verses that talk about just the sun and moon for a moment, they are both said to be dark, with the moon also said to be turning into blood. A solar eclipse would darken the sun, and a lunar eclipse would turn the moon red. But as I said a moment ago, these two things can't both happen at the same time, not naturally anyway. However, there are a couple of possibilities we should look at. One possibility is that, during a lunar eclipse, another object in our solar system goes between the Earth and the Sun, causing an unscheduled eclipse of the Sun. In this scenario, the Sun would be darkened, and the Moon would go from blood red to also becoming dark. This aligns with the descriptions in the Bible. 
Another possibility is that these events are not purely natural but involve supernatural phenomena. The Bible often describes end-time events with cosmic significance, suggesting that these occurrences might be beyond what we typically understand as natural phenomena. Regardless of the specifics, the important takeaway is that these events are described as dramatic, visible to everyone, and happening after a period of tribulation. They are not random astronomical occurrences, but rather part of a sequence of events leading up to the return of Jesus. In conclusion, while it's fascinating to explore astronomical phenomena and their potential significance in biblical prophecy, we should approach such interpretations with caution. The Bible provides clear descriptions of what will happen in the last days, and we should focus on understanding and preparing for those events rather than speculating about celestial signs happen at the same time, not naturally anyway. However, there are a couple of possibilities we should look at. Thank you for watching. If you found this video informative or thought-provoking, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends and family. Your support helps us reach more people with this important message. Also, feel free to leave your comments below. We love hearing from our audience and engaging in meaningful discussions. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel for more content like this. By subscribing, you'll stay updated on future videos and join our community of like-minded individuals. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.